It's hard to realize, unless you think about it, how recent this explosion of vehicles is. In 1950, we had about 50 million motorized road vehicles in the world. In 2001, we were approaching one billion. I moved to California in 1971, just out of law school. We drove across the country and drove down into Los Angeles over the pass, and uh, the first thing I saw was the most disgusting air I'd ever seen in my life. I really had no idea what smog was at that point. Uh, and uh, 1971 was by no means the worst of uh, smog in California. I started work in New York City in the early 70s. In those days, every single day of the year, seven days a week, we violated the carbon monoxide air quality standard. And we violated it by factors of two to three, every day. It's been several years now since there's been a carbon monoxide health violation in New York City. I can remember every afternoon you saw this smog bank coming in from the west, and which typically then would cause problems. You could be, your eyes might be watering, Clearly, it was impacting the crops at that time. You could see that lettuces would not survive. And it was a major issue. In a city like Delhi, vehicles were responsible for nearly 70% of the total air pollution load. And that was stunning. But it was very clear, you may relocate your industry, but you cannot relocate your vehicles. The cities are stuck with the vehicles that the old carburetor technology that had come into India during the 60s had not even changed. And the quality of the fuel, diesel, gasoline, was so dirty. Today, you have set the benchmark for the sulfur content at 10 to 15 parts per million. But imagine then, at that point of time in India, we had sulfur content as high as 5,000 to 10,000 parts per million. I remember driving along a street canyon in Manila and looking at all of the uh, parents going to work, wearing masks, waiting for their buses, and their children standing next to them going to school, wearing masks, because of the intense exposures they were getting from large numbers of diesel buses going by, stopping at the bus stop, and moving on. The principal focus was on health in the United States, and that tended to drive uh, the emission regulations. Uh, in Europe, uh, they did not have that focus. The breakthrough that occurred in Europe in terms of focusing on uh, emission regulations was acid rain, and as the climate change concerns began to grow, they took that a lot more seriously initially than we did here in the United States. And so you had this uh, sort of parallel set of programs, but addressing different issues from the transportation sector. The transportation sector is responsible for a, an enormous and growing portion of urban air pollution, climate pollution, oil consumption, really serious environmental, social, economic challenges. We still have, uh, according to the World Health Organization, something like uh, 400,000 people dying prematurely each year in Asia alone. Globally, more like 800,000 from just in big cities and primarily just from particulate matter, with vehicles being one of the big sources. The world has centered its attention in terms of environmental issues on climate change. 
And I think that there is a general agreement that it is a threat for the world. Uh, I don't think we can deny that at this point. But there are other problems that have regional or local effects, and this is the case of conventional pollutants. There has been a shift from uh, a almost exclusive focus on regulating conventional air pollutants to regulating greenhouse gases from vehicles. That's an important shift really needed to happen. I would not say that it is um, a wholesale shift. There is still plenty of need to reduce conventional air pollutants, particularly in the developing world. So regulators are really doing both things at once now, which is a good way to design policy. Fortunately, there are certain control measures that we can um, apply an instrument that will benefit uh, and reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and of conventional pollutants. An example of this is black carbon, which is a component of particles. So now that we are designing control measures to reduce emissions of particles, we're having it's a win-win situation. We're reducing emissions that affect public health, and also we're reducing emissions of a pollutant that's affecting the climate globally. We're now roughly 1.3 billion vehicles, somewhere like 68 or 69 million cars, trucks, and buses being produced in a given year. And we're retiring a smaller number of those each year. Uh, and we're making these vehicles more durable so they last longer. Uh, so uh, dealing with this continued growth, to, to get ahead of that curve, you have to be reducing emissions by more than this growing number of vehicles is each year. We're looking at China and India having vehicle fleets the same size as the United States um, and, in, and Europe within the next 10 to 15 years, maybe 20 years. But in that time period, the number of people, vehicles for every thousand people in those countries is still going to be much below our level. So the, we're looking at a century of incredible growth potential in these countries for vehicle fleets. So you cannot you know, just tell me the story from US because we are a developing country. So if you use or you just copy uh, the, the roadmap or the, the policies from US, probably it's done work in China. The unique feature of, say, Indian or the Asian market is the predominance of two-wheelers, motorcycles, which is you don't see in this part of the world. And those will require different kind of strategy altogether. The two-wheelers, which were considered conventionally to be the most polluting segment in our uh, cities. And therefore, many of us wanted to see the death of two-stroke two-wheelers. We did not want them anymore. But then, when the climate change debate came up, then suddenly the world realized that they are also the most fuel-efficient motorized vehicle in the world. I think there will continue to be a significant challenge, um, even 10 years out and 20 years out, and that is how rapidly we can use these new technologies to replace the old ones that are still there. Um, and particularly in poorer countries where there's less resource for changing over your new car every while or changing over your truck or your school bus every while. Um, getting that to happen much faster is going to be an enormous challenge and I suspect will still be there for us 10 years from now. The auto companies are globalized and the oil companies are globalized, but the people who set standards for them who determine how much pollution they emit or how much fuel they consume or indeed how safe they are, are all local. Um, and so they are struggling in each country with trying to establish a set of rational standards that make cars much safer and much cleaner over time. The primary uh, mechanism in my judgment that has enabled modernization of vehicle fleets in countries has been emissions regulations. So regulations for carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen have forced the fleets to modernize, to go to advanced technologies like fuel injection, electronic control systems, things like that, that then enable you to impose tight carbon dioxide controls. Over the last 50 years, there's been a, essentially a quiet revolution uh, in motor vehicle emission control technologies. Thanks to a continuous drumbeat of regulations, 
uh, one or two a year uh, over the course of the last 50 years in the United States, in California, in Europe, in Japan. Uh, the motor vehicle industry has responded with uh, improvements in technologies that have lowered the emissions over and over and over and over again. Uh, so it started with simple controls, it moved on to the catalytic converter, and then we had better air fuel controls. For diesel engines, we had fuel injectors. Um, and over time, you've now seen conventional pollutant emissions that are a tiny fraction of what they were in unregulated vehicles. Today, we can put the word clean and diesel one next to the other. If you told me that 10 years ago, I would say you're completely out of your mind. Uh, because there's no such thing as clean diesel. But today, diesel engines are extraordinarily clean. They're as clean as the cleanest gasoline engines. And the reason for that is because we force the technology. Fuel is very significant for two reasons. One is by reducing emissions from fuel, for example, reducing benzene, or reducing sulfur in gasoline, reducing sulfur in diesel, you get public health benefits across the board because existing cars will have to use this new fuel, not just the new cars. So the public health benefits are huge. But the second reason is because cleaner fuels enable the incorporation of more sophisticated advanced catalytic converters and, and emission control systems. You can have a clean fuel and you can combust it in a bad way and create NOx uh, and other hydrocarbons maybe. Uh, or you can get then a very clean engine where you maybe require after treatment and you put a fuel in there which says something like too high a sulfur which will poison the catalyst. So you have to recognize that you, you, can't do, you, you need to do both. Uh, we are seeing actually in some cases the, the advent of fuels from tar sands and oil shale that actually increase the, the life cycle greenhouse emissions of fuels. They don't go in the right direction. And even as we've seen, the, the true benefits of biofuels can really vary depending on how you do the analysis and how carefully you look at the full life cycle of, of energy used uh, and other indirect land use impacts as well. But coming to grips with how to get to low, truly low carbon fuels is going to be a major challenge going forward. Electric vehicles can reduce uh, CO2 emission by 70% maybe uh, compared to uh, gasoline vehicle CO2 emissions. And uh, in the very near future, we can introduce renewable energies, energy such as solar energy and wind energy. They can reduce CO2 more. So in the long term, we will be able to utilize electricity for EVs to reduce CO2 emissions in the transportation sector, especially for personal uh, transportation. The car manufacturers have done their part at this point, by and large. There are options out there in different sizes, different shapes, uh, different uh, amounts of um, uh, range that you can get off of a single charge. But we need to have a system in place where when you go into the showroom and order up one of these lovely vehicles, you can know that by the time you bring it home, you're going to have a charger there that will actually work. Uh, you're going to know what your rate is going to be for charging it. You're going to know that um, when you drive to work or you want to use it on weekends, there are going to be charging stations around or that you don't need to charge it. You don't, there will just be a whole level of support for this new industry that doesn't exist yet. As I said before, all the calculations I've seen that you're going to need a combination of the advanced technologies the electric drive technology, batteries and fuel cells and combination thereof, and biofuels, if we have any chance of getting uh, to where we need to go by 2050.